All right, welcome again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Sebo? Well, uh, there's so much in the news lately, since we haven't had a social episode in a couple of weeks. Uh, you wanted to talk about people being automatons, mm -hmm. which actually plays into something I had brought up earlier. I don't know what direction you're going with it, uh, but uh, we could also talk about some of the other big headlines if we want to go down little rabbit holes. We've got ships crashing into bridges. We've got uh, dumb Biden PR with trans day of visibility, which he denies ever saying. Uh, we've got, what else has happened in the last? We've got a VP pick for RFK. Ugh, don't remind uh, me. It, well, actually, what I would like to talk about a little bit there is I want to dispel some of the, the the kind of the I hate to use the word hateful, but kind of the very short sighted backlash on the even thought of Aaron Rodgers, because I've actually got some positive things to say there. Even the you know, not to say I would agree that he would be a great VP, but I can argue from a certain perspective that it's not as bad as people think. Uh, and let's see, anything else happen? No, that's it. That's, if something pops up, we'll talk about it. Uh, but as far as uh, what you were talking about, I don't know what you. I don't know what direction you're going to go. So I down, downward, downward, downward. It's okay, all doom and gloom. So, so let me start then, uh, because maybe it'll put a backdrop, uh, some underlying. Uh, Bio biology to what you might be saying unless you're going a completely different direction than i thought but uh there is something to be said about how things are done and it could be pushing us in a way of being basically less mindful and more mindless and what i mean by that is being aware of ourselves self-awareness and in space and what got me thinking about this was uh clifton duncan interviewing pete parada who used to be the drummer for uh offspring and now he's in the new band the defiant which is a band made up of people who were kicked out of their respective jobs because they wouldn't get the jab and uh and the the songwriter of smash mouth who has gotten all the medications but he supports their cause so uh it's the the lead singer from mighty mighty boss who at the time was the intro voice for the jimmy kimmel show and he was trying to work from home because I can do my job as say introing you from home because I never was on screen anyways, but they still kicked him out because he wouldn't comply. And uh, offspring drummer, he had he he basically has the same allergy Aaron Rodgers did that would cause him to have an allergic reaction to the jab, so he wouldn't take it. So the band kicked him out, and. Uh, Again, the Smash Mouth guy was was very sympathetic, and there's other guys that that kind of banded around them. But what he was talking about had nothing to do with that. What he was talking about was live drumming and what the difference was between uh, someone who just wanted to learn and and knew the steps versus someone who actually was an entertainer. And what he would talk about was practicing not only getting the beats down and hitting the right at the right time with the right rhythm and all of that, but he said it, it was it was an art of how hard you hit it at the time or where you emphasize the beats and it, all of these things to bring the crowd in and to basically tell a story and draw them into the music, not just have them nod their head along with it. And that that immediately clicked in my head because I had been studying stuff with vision that the real thing will always be better than the electronic version for that reason, because a real human is creating an experience for other humans. And I don't think AI, at least to the extent that we have it, can do that. But if you have the synthetic version, your brain develops differently. And the reason why vision got me kind of keyed in on that is... Uh, one of the things I brought up to my class when we were doing going over research papers was there's all these res, uh, research projects were using computer screens to study vision. And I was like, what if it's different in the real world? 
And it turns out it is. Real world objects are more memorable, memorable than photographs of objects. And this was despite how great a resolution it was, how 3D it looked on the photograph, the real thing created a more vivid memory within your system and fired a shit ton more of your brain up than seeing the exact same thing perfectly replicated in a photograph. And uh, part of that is you're automatically calculating space, 3D space. You're calculating space as well as seeing the object. And just that removal of that stimulus creates a totally different stimulus in your brain. Same thing with music. We've got these beat machines now. Everything is done. All our pop music and everything is done on a beat machine. The drummer themselves doesn't even matter anymore. They're doing these, these things. And, and yeah, it's talented to be able to put it all together. And But at the same time, it hits different. It hits different parts of your brain. So we've got a mass of people just going as a hive instead of actually feeling the experience anymore. That sadly makes me think of um, what my lighthearted break was over the weekend while I was doing stuff and I was listening to um, uh, Coleman Hughes. You, you, you broke my brain there. I kept wanting to call him Clifton Hughes because you said Clifton Duncan earlier. Anyway, Coleman Hughes uh, uh, with Chris Williamson on Modern Wisdom. And, uh, and they were talking about, you know, race, race politics and policy and culture. And so I don't remember the context he brought this up, but Hughes made the point that he worries about Gen Z because they have so many fewer experiences than we did growing up. And Hughes, Hughes isn't that old. I think he's in his early 30s. I think Williamson's the old guy there, right? I think I think, I think uh, uh, Coleman Hughes, he just graduated like two years ago. So yeah. he's like he's like late twenties. He's because he, he's got a doctor in philosophy, I believe. So it seems like such an odd thing to say because I've got a thousand friends, and I, you know, I I say this, and I and I'm, I mean it literally, though it sounds joking. You have a supercomputer in your pocket. We have become so used to it. It it, it should boggle your mind the processing power you have at your fingertips and the knowledge you have at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. I have any question. I can look it up. I want to see something. I can look it up and see it. But the, the thought that that triggered when he said that was, you know, he's right. And it's not just the, um, the desensitizing or the deforming of the developing brain because of what they're the, the content of what they're seeing and hearing but also the context the method mm -hmm. that yes you have all these experiences but they're all virtual they're not real we've we've uh of a part part of what got them on this train was something we've railed about which is the you know you're just swiping left and right. You've never had an actual real conversation trying to pick up a girl. The, the, the natural back and forth that happens there, the, the way it activates your brain and the way it makes your brain work. You, you've already done most of the work just by getting, you know, to the first meetup from swiping, right. Mm -hmm. And so, you're not real. You're becoming part of the virtual world. And and this popped into my head a few weeks ago um, because one of the topics of, that came up when I was talking to the wife after leaving Dune 2 um, was that I like Villeneuve, but he's really hit or miss. And and one of the one of his recent movies that was kind of a hit, but everything I heard about it was black or white. It was people who liked it really liked it. If you didn't like it, you thought it was terrible. And I never found anyone who didn't watch Blade Runner twenty forty nine for the reason I didn't watch it, which was that 
The original Blade Runner, in popular opinion, is really overrated, but it is really interesting, and it is a pretty good cult classic for it's a cult classic for a reason. But to me, the most interesting part of the story is the question of if Harrison Ford is himself an android. And they 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 hit that, and then you know, there are whole segments of the fan base that argue back and forth about this. And to me, it didn't matter. And, and I had heard that 2049 answers the question. Well, to me, that ruins it because Harrison Ford is either a human who has lost his humanity and regains it, learning it from an android. That's where the line more human than human comes from. I'm you call me fake you're out to destroy me because I'm not real but I'm more human than you are because you're dead inside or he was always an android and he learns to become human to to actually become human which for Philip K Dick what that was was empathy that's that whole test that he gives when he's testing to see if you're you're an android he has these weird you know, psych questions. He's testing to see if you have empathy because to Dick, that was what, that was what made you human. That was what humanity was, was empathy. And, and he feared a losing of that, of, of your humanity getting lost in technology. And he's writing in the sixties and seventies, the virtual world was part of sci-fi that was you know one of his i don't know who originally created the idea but the idea of an online virtual world is something he created way back before you know anyone had even thought of how to actually create it and i shudder to think what kind of futurist sci-fi people like him or sagan or whatever would think of our modern world and Oh, oh dear, did that prediction come true, but not in the way I, I thought it would? Well, I'm going to say it's not just empathy. Empathy is just one part of uh, what I think it is. It's consciousness. But I'll, I'll put another word on it that, that'll make sense. Self-awareness. Our default mode network. So that's separate from our sensory network because it needs to work separate. When you are specifically working on a task that requires your sensory network, the default mode network down regulates. And if you have trouble down regulating, your mind wanders because the default mode network is what attaches context to everything you do. It, 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 create, it, 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 it allows for the bigger picture. So it's the, I wrote something down on this paper but it's the why, it's the how, it's the it's all of the things that come into it. Uh, and so it downregulates when you are very focused on a task that you are doing. But if there's a memory component to that task, it actually upregulates a little bit because you, you would actually benefit from having that memory or the context from previous experience. So, it, but if, you, if you're relatively far away from any active focused task, it's an overdrive. You're think, you're, your mind is wandering. You're contemplating all of these things about yourself, about other people. And empathy comes into that because self you can't have awareness of others until you're aware of yourself. That, that, that just does, it doesn't work that way because you have to put their feelings into context. And you don't have context unless you've already had your own feelings. Well, so, let's go down the rabbit hole of where my thought process went and i will say that that one of the things i find interesting about when i went down this rabbit hole of um speeches and letters and interviews of of philip k dick is when the the stories of him which are known in popular culture um especially right now what people would would know most is blade runner and, and he was also the writer of The Man in the High Castle. Now, both of these and a lot of his others, you would consider dystopian. And yet he was something of an optimist when you actually uh, read uh, 
what he says and in this this speech at a 1972 sci-fi convention he he goes through th this idea and he talks about um you know the primitive mind anthropomorphizes the environment and you need to you need to get away from that um but this poses a problem of um well as he says, one wonders, has he not also in this process reified, that is, made into a thing, other people? And that is really a psychological problem. And its solution, I think, is of less importance in any case than one might think, because within the last decade, again, he's writing, he's, he's saying this in 1972, we have seen a trend not anticipated by our earnest psychologists or by anyone else, which dwarfs that issue. Our environment, and I mean our man-made world of machines, artificial constructs, computers, electronic systems, interlocking homeostatic components, all this is in fact beginning more and more to possess what the earnest psychologist fear the primitive sees in his environment. Animation. In a very real sense, our environment is becoming alive, or at least quasi-alive, and in ways specifically and fundamentally analogous to ourselves. So... He thought that... Well, and, and as I said earlier, analogous with important key components missing that you can't feel or yes. see. Yes. Um, oh, where is it? So, so he thought that, well, we could go backwards, that by um, kind of what you've been talking about, that... Uh, uh, you, you're not worried about AI be, because you're looking at what AI can't do, what what its limitation is, and why it's not really human. And that is basically what he is saying in a big chunk of this speech is because our environment is becoming so um, real, we can study machines and say – why isn't that a human? What does that tell me about myself? Um, but there's a, I think a, the, the hiccup here is, um, uh, let me find it here. Machines are becoming more human, so to speak. Some meaningful comparison exists between human and mechanical behavior. But is it not ourselves that we know first and foremost? Rather than learning about ourselves by studying our constructs, perhaps we should make the attempt to comprehend what our constructs are up to by looking into what we ourselves are up to. And, and I think that goes along with what, what you just said about consciousness and, and where I see the negative side of, of what we're doing as opposed to the optimistic way uh, uh Philip K. Dick would have used our virtual world to learn more about yourself because what I think he says there, especially in the younger generations, is wrong. Do we not first and foremost know ourselves? I don't think we do. I don't think we know ourselves because we have abandoned humanity what he and you, I think, both the empathy and the consciousness to indulge in instinct. So we're not really acting consciously. We're just indulging that dopamine feedback loop. Let, let, let me let's go back to AI to contextualize this a little bit, which I use the word that is actually what's missing. So this is why AI is not as successful as they'd like it to be. This, OK, this is my opinion about why AI is not as successful as they'd like it to be. It's because what we have is a uh, stimulus processing center and a database. So if you're looking at the brain, it would be like your visual cortex, your auditory cortex, your, your, uh, your, like your olfactory lobes and all of those things that get the feedback from the environment and allow you to take action on that. And the hippocampus, which is basically the storage center of the memories, right? So you have those two things in AI. You have the database and you have the stimulus uh, the stimulus response kind of uh, mode. 
but you you don't have the contextualization. You don't have the the concept. You don't have the deeper what does these what do these things mean? You just have stimulated by environment, react to stimulus and store the facts about it in the database. You don't have that other deeper part we have as humans. Now here let's let's take that thought and now let's look at something humans do now that I think is super dangerous. I think, and I, I find myself doing it still too, and I try to really, really, really limit this, doom scrolling. Someone sends you an Instagram reel, and you go, ha ha, funny, and swipe up. Swipe up, 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 swipe up. 15 minutes later, go, whoa. 15 minutes just went by. And... Tell me during that time, did you have a deep thought about anything? You were purely in stimulus action, stimulus action, stimulus action. Your default, the swipe up mechanism on social media completely turns off your default mode network. Give me a memory that you formed in any of those reels you just saw. Maybe one broke through that you thought was funny. I guarantee you it was the last one. The one where you woke up and realized you were in default mode network is a, is a, uh, is a misleading term because it's actually, there's actually a lot going on there. Swiping up. You're actually kind of in a default mode boop, 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 action, 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 action. There is no, there is no context to anything you just did. That party, it, 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 it's like the ultimate drug to turn off this part of your brain that puts deeper meaning to anything in your life. Mind wandering is a good thing sometimes. So this goes into my last point here um, where, where he gives the, um, the, the negative example of rather than learning you know, more about ourselves. I would like then to ask this, what is it in our behavior that we can call specifically human that is special to us as a living species? And what is it that at least up to now we can consign as merely machine behavior or by extension, insect behavior or reflex behavior? And I would include in this the kind of pseudo human behavior exhibited by what were once living men creatures who have in ways i wish to discuss next become instruments means rather than ends and hence to me analogs of machines in the bad sense in the sense that although biological life continues metabolism goes on the soul for a lack of a better term is no longer there or at least no longer active and where that's coming from, this led me to this interesting rabbit hole, uh, which uh, you see this wonderful title of this uh, uh, Disability Studies Quarterly. Um, Philip K. Philip Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The movie was Blade Runner, Runner and the post-humanism of the American eugenics movement. Because what this guy reads into... The, the novel or the novella is that part of what is going on is um, perfecting humanism by getting rid of negative biology and That was something that would have been known, and he studied um, history and philosophy a lot, and he also studied the Nazis a lot. And if, for anyone who doesn't know, yes, the Hitler and the Nazis, their mechanism to get rid of undesirables came from the American eugenics movement. And why does that matter? Well, um, oh crap, where'd it go? Here it is. Okay. Um, 
alone in the, when he was uh, researching The Man in the High Castle, a speculative novel envisioning a United States ruled by victorious Axis power, alone in the closed stacks at UC Berkeley, he discovered the diaries of an SS officer stationed in Warsaw. One line struck him. We are kept awake at night by the cries of starving children. I thought, there is amongst us something that is a bipedal humanoid morphologically identical to the human being, but that is not human. He later told Starlog, an old science fiction magazine that I tried to find and I couldn't find an archive of this interview. It is not human to complain in your diary that starving children are keeping you awake. That's autom automaton, autonomous behavior. Uh, cries of starving children, interrupting sleep, must sleep, sleep important. Uh, dude, starving children, bad. Uh, and in an interview I did find, he talked about how he'd, he'd yeah, spent seven years translated, doing research. Translated, it's not the fact that they were starving children that was bothering him and wouldn't let him sleep. It was the fact that their crying is interrupting his sleep was the complaint. Exactly. Yeah. And, and he said that people often wondered why he didn't uh, write a sequel because it was one of his more successful, one of his first really successful novels. And he said, I, I couldn't because I would have to go back to that world. I would have to go back to those diaries and, the stuff I read was just so horrible. It it consumed me, and I, I couldn't go back and write it. And, it. and it was that lack of empathy. And boy, howdy. Empathy is a big buzzword these days. But <sighs> then I found this. how Philip K. Dick redefined what it means to be inhuman on something called the conversation. And of course, immediately it goes into this image portrays certain qualities, whiteness, masculinity, heterosexuality, rationalism, professional success, and physical prowess as the ideal symbols of humanity's success. <laughs> oh, geez. Dude, you just you missed the whole freaking point. And, and I had um, I had just finished listening to the rest of um, Weinstein on, on, on Williamson. And when they got around to talking about the woke movement, the DEI, CRT, Rainbow Mafia craziness, Weinstein made this great point um, that I think need, really needs to be echoed, which is that the 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 kernel of the movement that is good is the idea that you know I'm paraphrasing Weinstein that there are these marginalized people these, these groups of people who for whatever reason have been marginalized by society as a whole and they need our empathy they need to be brought into the tribe instead of marginalized ostracized and, and living on the fringes but instead of expanding our empathy for these marginalized groups, instead, what this movement does is it treats empathy as a zero-sum game, and you instead have to take empathy away from other groups. That if you are the privileged, if you are the powerful, then you have to not just we don't have empathy for you we are hostile towards you and uh hughes talked about this with um oh not kendy the lady who was a big part of the um crt d'angelo d'angelo that he he thinks what she says about how uh as he says you know, Coleman Hughes is a black man talking to a white man. You, Chris Williamson, you just have to sit there and listen. How inhuman is that to take away your agency 
as a human being, as an individual, you're not allowed to have your own thoughts. You know, e even if it's even if it's just earnest questioning, just the earnest asking of questions. No, no. You have to be led in any conversation remotely led about race by the person of color. So he was just horrified to him. That was the great evil of CRT was this idea that by virtue of the color of one's skin, I can take away your agency, your being. That's why he calls it neo-racism because that's what old fashioned white supremacy was about. That was the justification for slavery was, you know, in, in the America, in America, because slavery has been around since humans have been around but it was always a part of might makes right you're you're my slave because i have the power to make you my slave well we're founded on a creed that caused problems and so oh well see that's not a real person and look what atrocities that led to right here in the you know, land founded on the ideal of um, personal sovereignty, the sovereignty of the citizen and liberty and rationality and also Christian ethos. And look what that lack of humanity led to. I was looking for something because I'm trying to remember what the story was. It was... Uh... You talk about Coleman Hughes being told to sit down and shut up by a white woman. By the way, there uh, it was. It was. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was a school and DEI stuff or if it was uh, a defund the police thing. But nobody supported it, and the news article said that they were white adjacent or something. All the 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 people of color that that were like, no, we don't want this, and basically the whole community. <laughs> was like oh well that that's because they're they're uncle toms and it's like you can't do that, that that's that's how you play that's how they're playing the game you know, mm -hmm. oh well you know we we respect black voices but when they say the thing we don't want them to say oh they're uncle toms I and mean, it's just come on d'angelo you don't you're the one that needs to sit down and shut up because you're a privileged white girl that which is what you say in your own books that has no idea outside of your university, what life is like. Uh, you know, it's it's like the Latinx. Go to Southwest Military Drive in San Antonio and start saying, hello, my Lat Latinx peoples. Uh, that was something he talked about. And Hughes cited polling numbers. And I didn't know this, but he, sa he said, I'm half Puerto Rican. I grew up speaking Spanish, you know, in, in around my family. And... Latinx makes no sense. It makes no sense for the language. And in fact, he cited polling that only 4% had both even heard the term and approved of it, liked it. Only something like another 16, so like 20% total had even heard the term. Mm -hmm. it, well, it's because they, it, it's, it's prevalent in circles. Academia elite circles, media, it's nowhere on the street. Mm -hmm. As uh, Roland Fryer always says in all his interviews, he said, go to my home, you know, go to my home neighborhood and say, hello, my people of color, and you're beat up. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. Not wrong. Not wrong. There was something right. I wanted to throw in there, and I can't remember what it was. Well, let me give my last thought on this because it's it's interesting that we uh, couldn't get to it last week because I was feeling bad. And and so waiting has led me to a different uh, final point here um, because as the guy on the right, I feel obligated to you, you, you need to police your own tribe and. So I'm usually the one attacking the right from the right. Well, that that's what I'm doing because I'm an American. Uh, yeehaw, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm policing everybody that is also well, identified as American. Uh, 
one of the reasons the Latinx thing makes me laugh, but is also an interesting intellectual point is what, why is it around? Well, in part, because so many people have never even heard of it. So at least they have an excuse of, wait, what, you know, they're not stopping it because the, 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 the people in these neighborhoods have never even heard of it. Well, the right doesn't have an excuse at the, the, the right as a whole for um, failing to act. And, and so because it was the Easter weekend and you brought up the egg roll um, and I found this interesting study. So RMG research is a uh, pew. So Pew used to be the most respected and reliable pollster. Um, he sold it. Uh, I forget how many years ago. So Pew Research isn't actually Pew anymore. So he started this new firm, RMG Research. And in the, the week before Easter, they did a survey of a thousand registered voters, national survey, good sample size, and he's known for having low margins of errors in his poll. So this is Americans. True or false, the man known to history as Jesus Christ actually existed and walked the earth. 83% of Americans say that's true. Okay, well, that, that doesn't mean months. That's just a historical fact. Okay, true or false. There's a freaking cat in front of my screen now. Jesus <laughs> Christ was the son of God. 76%. Okay. That's a lot. Jesus Christ died for your sins. I find it odd that it's 1% lower. Um, okay. There yeah, might be seriously. your there might be your margin of error. Yeah. The plus or minus 1% and you know that 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 would show that they're actually uh calculating their margin of error correctly. But but now you get in. I, the last two questions are interesting because now you get into a more serious drop. But now you're asking about the supernatural part of it, uh, the, the real supernatural part of it, the miracles and the whatnot. Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. Sixty eight percent of Americans say that is true. Jesus I think died water, for your sins is supernatural, too. Well, you could still just be a human martyr. You could still just be a, a philosopher, a Buddha type, whatever. A and I'm, I'm, I'm dying for you. My followers would still be important. It would still be meaningful. In okay, a I can see that point. I can religious sense, and and so that's why to me the last two are the real, are the miraculous stuff. Why this made me so angry is, um. I had been thinking about uh, Peterson, Jordan Peterson recently um, because I'm, I'm still, I just about to finally finish uh, Nahum Sarna's understanding Genesis, which is a really deep, even though it's a short book, it's a really deep book because he's, you know, Sam Harris, Sapolsky brain level. Um, and, you know, you can go way back when he was still teaching at Harvard and find the series he did on biblical stories. So he had, he had used the stories of Genesis and Exodus for a while as tools for analyzing human psychology. You know, he, he had been big on this for a while of what do these stories tell us? What, what is being conveyed? What wisdom is being t passed down to teach us what it means to be human and what our human nature is and how we interact with each other. And, and then a few years ago, people started getting on to him and for some reason pestering him with, are you a Christian? And then that led to why won't you say, um, and Dennis Prager surprised him when they did their round table on Exodus. Cause Prager said, we were on stage doing a thing. And, and I asked you this, this question and you said something that impacted me as a you know it, prager is an avowed orthodox jew who has written books on the subject 
And and Peterson was surprised to hear him say it has stuck with me these years later and I use it, which is his answer was basically, well, you just can't say something like that, eh? To 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 if you really ponder, if you really internalize what it means to declare that that is a proactive thing. That is something that, if you are being honest, is a compelling thing, because that isn't just a statement of belief. That is a statement of action. Where is the action when 83% of Americans believe that the man known to history as Jesus Christ actually existed and walked on Earth, and 65% go so far as to say, yeah, and the dude could walk on water. Where is the action that represents these espoused beliefs? You are an automaton. You are going through the motions. You are zombie scrolling through church. You are zombie scrolling through your Bible, which you can do now because mine is on my phone. But that's a subject for later. No, but there's a difference between reading on your phone and scrolling through stimuli material well but but how much how much of because you read part of it you read part of it how many sentences do you get through before you have a secondary thought about what you're reading that secondary thought is that default mode network contextualizing what you're reading it's not just the letters on the page whereas when you're doom scrolling what's your secondary thought on the chicken running around without his head on or something you know that as you're just going through what's your secondary thought on that you can still doom scroll through your Christianity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, have, I'm getting your point there. Yeah. How, how much? How much of modern Christianity is? And I'm rarely on Facebook, but I check in every once in a while. And surely, yours has to be as bad as mine when you're scrolling through and you've got those family members that it's just every other post is some sort of Christian meme. I yeah th- that's that's the difference they're memeing it and they're not reading it they're not they're not thinking about it they're not contextualizing it they're re- and I actually uh, I'll have to say it, I haven't the the, the follow up on this has been not very not very productive but I probably lost a friend to this because she is always memeing the the feel good christianity vibes and we were all at a game night together. And I, I'm a fidgety guy. If you can't tell from watching this podcast, if you're just listening to it, you still hear it in my voice. I'm a fidgety guy. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, you know, my leg is shaking as it tends to do, which I know is annoying to other people. But when I'm not thinking about it, it does it. When I'm not thinking about it, I bite my nails. You know, all of those things. And some people translate that to, I'm uncomfortable. I'm nervous. I'm worried. I'm anxious. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not anxious. My body just needs to move. And she said, I, I know what will fix you. It's brought me peace. And she's always the, you know, put it in God's hand. Da, 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 da. Like, like I said before on this podcast, it's like 5% of the Bible. People forget about the 95% that require hard work. You know, mm-hmm. the other part is I know she's miserable. Because she's totally lost in this modern dating game. She is totally lost in this, this, uh, I need to be happy now. Happiness is how I feel in the moment. All of these things. She's, she's fallen for the, 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 the social media farce of what happiness is. And she's miserable. That's the irony of the social media happiness is they use the word happy or self-care or all of these things so much. And everybody who follows it is completely miserable. And after she said that, I couldn't help myself. I said, I'm fine. You're the one that's miserable. And of course I was drunk at the time. Not, well, yeah, I was pretty, pretty. We were all pretty intoxicated at the time. And it started a big fight. And it got onto the, you know, Uh, you know, like you're always all over head over heels in love. And then two weeks later, he's the most horrible person in the world. There's one common denominator here. Not every guy you've dated can be this bad, you know, and all of these things that, that all came out in a flood and we haven't quite repaired that damage yet, but it's the same start. Like you said, they're memeing 
the thing. Yes, Christianity can bring you peace if you truly believe in the, the edicts of it. She has no peace. And so your automaton universe of people are miserable. That's the common denominator. They're all miserable. Where this ties into so much of the awfulness going on right now is, you know, yes, there are actual conspiracies. We've shown actual documents of conspiratorial behavior on the show. And, you know, others of us who, you know, have way more followers and do this for a living have investigated and shown a light on actual conspiracies. But not everything is. The, it's highly improbable that the Chinese hacked the ship and made it crash into this bridge. Okay. Of it was the Russians. Exactly. So what worries me more is how much is just autonomous, be, uh, automatic behavior on a subpar level. You know, it's one thing to go through the motions if you're really good at what you do. And and so you're always at least average. But when you're just going through the motions and we have created such a culture of nihilism and nothing matters, then your automatic behavior is going to be a D minus at best. Well, and then uh, you're going to crash into a bridge. Don't don't give China too too much credit uh, because remember TikTok is from China. And I brought up Instagram Reels. Instagram Reels was an imitation of TikTok to get that business yeah. back that they were losing to TikTok. They realized how people were gravitating towards that because it's an addictive behavior, an addictive behavior that people thought was harmless. And so the Instagram Reels was a response to that. So the actual quote unquote attack was unleashing this thing on the Western world because they don't do it the same way in their own country. Mm -hmm. They're longer videos. They're educational. They, they're, they're not scroll, 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 scroll. It, it, it is a, it is an educational system for their kids in their country. Whereas here it's short video, dancing, short video, this da, 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 joke, choo, 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 choo. And then 40 minutes later, you sat on the pot too long and now you got hemorrhoids. So, <laughs> Well, it, it, my point being kind of where you started out is how, how much of this, you know, doom scrolling through our virtual life, how much is that going to impact our in real life when we look up? Are we still zombified? Right? And so... If you don't have that consciousness, then you, you're not really proactively doing anything, you know, which part of consciousness, part of self is whatever the heck it is you're doing, you want to do it well, or at least well enough to have a, a degree of satisfaction. Because we are humans and we take satisfaction in satisfactorily doing something. And more so, the better we do it. But if you're not a human, if you're, you know, some analogous uh, machine, what was it? How did it, did it call it? Pseudo human behavior. Then. And your if bridge crashes. If that's the extent of our future, then it's adaptive to get that way. But I don't I think we're skipping a step here. You know, we still yeah. live it. We still live in a 3D world. Uh, we don't have robots that can read our minds and do everything we need them to do. It's not Wally yet. You know, it's yeah. it, it, it's we're, we're, we still have to. Inter I, I'm worried because we're hitting the first generation of grew up on screens, kids that are driving now. Focused attention versus broad attention are completely different things. And it's it, like I brought up with vision, spatial awareness is important. And when we talk about sense of self, that's your, there is a spatial component to that because where am I in space? Hmm. 
where is my body? It's proprioception. You know, I know my hand is over here, even though I, well, I guess I can see it because of the screen. I know my hand is behind me because I just know it's behind me, not because I can see it and I have to look back. Oh, there's my hand. Uh, whereas if you see everything on a screen, you never develop that spatial awareness. Watch kids walk around and almost run into everything, even when they're not looking at their phone. I, I, went, I pulled into our neighborhood the other day and Ben was walking down the sidewalk and my truck's pretty easy to spot because it's pretty unique compared to everything else there. And I drove by and I waved at him and he kind of looked through me and crossed the road as if I wasn't there. I'm like, dude, did you not notice this truck that's unique, recognizable, makes a lot of noise, your dad waving at you? He's like, oh, I didn't see you. Yeah. There you go. You're going to be driving one day. This is scary. Well, and the that's just on the most micro level. On the macro level, there is a conspiratorial element because there is a group who benefits from us being zombies. From, you know, 70-something percent of uh, uh, America ostensibly should have been outraged about Biden's Easter shenanigans. And yet maybe the 20% that gets monetized, you know, that's, that's feeding the grift of the rage porn, you know, so maybe the 20% get oh, outraged until the next outrage comes along until the next outrage comes along until the next outrage comes along. And then we forget you know, how, how much stuff has been forgotten? I can't even remember the context of someone going through the list of, hey, you know, and I, and I think it was in the context of the bridge and how long is this going to hold our attention? Because, hey, remember this thing that happened? Hey, remember when that thing happened? The Vegas shooter, we still know nothing about. Well, I mean, just, just contemplate that. Well, in large part, because we're all doom scrolling through life. And so we're not demanding that something actually be done. We're just instinctively outraged. And then we move on to the next dopamine hit. Yeah. Which is funny. I, cause there are a lot of Catholic Democrats and I do, I am curious to see if this actually makes a dent because how how much Catholics get offended over the weirdest things and they're so picky about the verbiage and the and the the rules and and how it really goes oh well that was a not a true true marriage that one was an old but because mm -hmm. of this thing and this thing and this thing and blah, 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 blah. and they they will jump through hoops to 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 get everything perfect by their doctrine and you just kind of took a shit on Easter. That to me is it. it, it I, I'm wondering what the reaction is going to be. I saw the Twitter outrage reaction, but I mean the actual deep down to its roots. Mm. Wait, you, what? Where was the Pope? Where was the Pope the, during this? Oh wait, he's woke too. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Because re uh, I know a lot of super devout Catholics, and they're they're really upset about the whole trans issue to, to begin with. I'm like, but your Pope says it's okay. Isn't that what, all you need? And they're like, oh, well, blah, blah, blah. And they'll do some mental gymnastics that, oh, he's not perfect. But I'm like, but yeah, but actually the Catholic Church says he is. So he's as close to perfect as you can be on this earth. And uh I don't know. We we'll see where, where they are. What's the message going out? And I'll have to ask my mom because... She'll know, but uh, we'll we'll see what's going out. But it's it's to of course Biden denies it, which tells you one of two things: he's either lying, which I don't think he is, or as we've all suspected, he's not the one making decisions mm -hmm. because there's a big long white page on WhiteHouse.gov that says these words in my name. Joseph Biden signed at the bottom. Did he not even have to sign off on this or just people doing this? Yeah. And both are disturbing 
either he's just an outright liar or people are doing these things for him and he has no clue. Uh, and he's telling the truth when he says, I didn't say anything like that. Uh, but whoever did it, whether it's him or somebody else, it was an obvious attack. It was an obvious insult. I am an atheist and I still told you happy Easter mm -hmm. because I know it's important to you. It has nothing to do with my feelings. It's not about me. It's because it's important to you. A friend, a friend of mine who's a Jehovah's Witness invited me to their annual observance of Jesus sacrifice a couple weeks ago. And I respectfully declined. But I said, knowing how much it means to you creates the creates the weight it has to receive it. That that's that that's how much of a compliment it was for me. Mm -hmm. for you to invite me to this because I know how much it means to you. You can have that kind of respect without having the same belief system. What, what happened on Sunday was the opposite of that. It was the, I not only don't respect you, I don't respect you so much. I'm going to throw something in the face of something the mo that's most dear to you. And if Jesus and the afterlife and the, you know, the, the resurrection is not the most important to, thing to you as a Christian, you're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. as you said, people just going through the meme motion. If that's not the most important thing to you about your faith, you're not a Christian because that's what makes it Christianity. That's the entire point mm -hmm. of it, of the, the li literally it's like, so way back when we had our d abortion debate and I said, you distill it down and there's only one real question. It's, what is human life and when does it begin? Everything else is, you know, detail, some of which matter and some of which don't. Well, you distill it down and Christianity is either a guy named Yeshua of Nazareth was executed and three days later rose from the dead and walked around for a while preaching some more before he ascended into heaven or he didn't. It is that simple. You know, it, it, it's it's not easy because, again, there's all this other stuff that are details, some of which matter and some of which don't. But when you boil it down, yeah, it's Easter. We, we, we all love to decorate and sing the carols and watch Scrooge because it's the greatest Christmas movie ever after Die Hard. But that's, you know, that's not the big deal. That was, a, you know, not even the beginning of the big deal. That's what Good Friday is. It, that, that's kind of a, the, if that's the big deal, that's the, like the nihilist view of life is my last accomplishment was being born <laughs> and everything else was downhill, <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, downhill after that. Yeah. No, no. How I died. I mean, especially from a masculine, not to let yeah. credence to the, uh, the, the, your little woke article from earlier, but the masculine view at how I died is actually more important than mm -hmm. when I was born. I had nothing to do with when I was born. Well, I mean, for 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 believers in a component of apologetics, which is the fancy word for uh, uh, um, rational, like the the proof, you know, the 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 lawyer's argument for why Christianity is real. Uh, one of the apologetics arguments is how the apostles, how the martyrs died, because. Would you be willing to put up with that for something that's a fraud? Because they they went out like they went out like bosses, you know the 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 creative and horrible ways that were invented to kill some of these guys, and to the end, they would not renounce their faith. So yeah, that the 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 matter of death does matter. Yeah, which always brings me to the irony of my namesake, the child martyr. How am I alive if you died as a child? I'm thinking maybe he had a brother that's like, ooh, sucks for you. We'll uh, pass your name on as we go. Uh, but don't don't stone me. <laughs> Let's see. We, we, we were we were the 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 uh <laughs> we were the progeny of the of the not so brave brother. <laughs> Oh, 
Yes. Sir not appearing in this film. That's your yes. lineage. Yes. <laughs> uh, you should get that joke. Um, I had a thought and it was, oh, um, speaking of uh, being an automaton, here's a practical example, because when you sent me Happy Easter, my response was, I'm glad it was a cold and chilly Easter in Oklahoma, because I'm out helping my dad do stuff, and I've spent too long in the burbs, because for anyone who doesn't know this, if something is lying on top of tall grass, leaf litter, whatever, and you're in Texas, you don't pick it up like this. <laughs> you pick it up away from you. Uh, l luckily, it's been cold enough that the if there were any out there, they were in their burrows. Because, well, but you got to be careful because sometimes those are their burrows. Because sometimes they make their burrow under something, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it dawned on me by the time we'd gotten to the last thing that I was moving around, I really should be watching where I step and being careful of how I lift this stuff because I've lived in the burbs too long and I have forgotten these basic facts. Yeah. I didn't see any last time I was working out at my mom's property, but they sent me a picture because they had an Easter surprise, a nice big long coral snake, red and yellow, red and yellow, the the, the good kind, not the, the, not the good kind, the kind that can kill you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And for for those who have doubted me when I have told that story, you can find them that far away from the ocean. That's the joy of South Texas is we had first moved there and we were out hunting uh, and so it's, it's quail season and yet it's warm enough for uh, Jake the snake to be sliding around and it was so surprising to find this thing that even the veterinarian had to go yellow and black, yellow red. Yep, that's not a king snake. <laughs> yeah, it's uh no, this is actually like the third one they found out there. Of course, where where we, I guess you mostly grew up, but where we grew up, that's kind of like the Australia of Texas, because you have all four major. Venom venomous snakes you've got coral snakes rattlesnakes copperheads and cottonmouths you've got uh venomous scorpions you've got black widows you got brown recluse spiders you've got the venomous centipedes uh i think there's even a venomous millipede that's out there so basically everything that could kill you in the united states that little spot has every single one of them mm -hmm. or at least a, a a certain species of those that, that are there it's like Come on, man. And copperheads, if anybody doesn't know, they are almost impossible to see. You better hope they move before you accidentally step on them. But usually, they just kind of coil up a little tighter. That's the movement you get before you accidentally step on one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then their their venom is necrotic, so yeah. starts rotting away your muscles. Joy! Yeah, you're not likely to die if you're our size, is a, in, but you will lose whatever muscle they 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 snapped into. Uh, I had a client that had a, only half a calf on one side because he was bit by a copperhead on that side. Uh, uh, rattlesnakes are similar, but rattlesnakes are like the most polite snake. <laughs> they they don't want to they don't want to bite you. They they shake their little tail and they slither away for a little bit, and, unless you really 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 threaten them or you surprise them. But if if they see you coming, they'll they'll get they'll give you a little warning. Masculinity properly restrained, because if you don't heed their warning, they have the fastest documented strike of any snake. Yes. Now copperheads are uh, kind of similar. They don't want to strike you, but they're quiet about their passivity. <laughs> they just kind of coil up a little tighter and get ready in case you threaten them. But they don't tell you that they're there. And it's like, don't you know you're so hard to see? Now, cottonmouths, on the other hand, cottonmouths are freaking vicious. They will they're, chase they're jerks. They will chase you. People don't believe you. City, city slickers don't believe you when, when you tell them that. They will chase you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. They're territorial and they give live birth, which they get protective over their burrows. But it's also worse. Don't accidentally get in the burrow because then you've got hundreds of little mouths biting you that don't know how to control their 
uh, their venom at that time. Yeah. Because what happens with a pit viper is they do have the necrotic venom. When they strike their prey, they actually, as adults, only put out a little bit of their venom, just enough to kill their target. So if it's a mouse, they've learned how much because the first kill they have, they don't control. And then they eat their kill. And because there's so much venom in it, they get sick and they throw it back up. So they learn, oh, I need to do less. And over time, they get it just right. So they're not sick with their own food. There's your biology lesson for the day. Here. Yay. Yay. But I got to watch one because I had a copperhead in a terrarium for a little bit, which scared the shit out of me every night because I also read that they're great escape artists. So I would wake up like 10 times. Still there? Okay. Still there. Okay. But uh, I, it was... It, we were supposed to be keeping it for somebody who milks them, but they never were responding. So I was like, I got to feed this thing. So I went and bought a little little white rat at the, the pet store and I opened the little thing, dropped it in there. And this rat started around because he was he was in a new place. He didn't know what was going on. And this thing just went hit him in the back legs. And the rat's like, oh, shit. And he's a little slower because he's only got two legs going like this. And the thing went again and the rat went, flopped over and just slowly he just started sucking it in head first and it was like that scared the shit out of me Ugh, I, we gotta get rid of this thing hello Heath sorry for that little hiccup Heath has completely lost all internet connection uh, we were about to close out anyway so let me just do that uh kind of bring everything back in and circle it in. Uh, not only does it seem like as a society, we're kind of becoming autonomous, like uh, automatons versus autonomous, uh, but just, just kind of think about in your life, all your interactions in real life, in person, are going to have a different effect on how you develop than what's happening on the screens. So just like with exercise, everything you do or don't do changes your uh, your physical nature. Same thing with your mind. So whatever you're thinking about or whatever you're doing uh, and how you're interacting it with, with your environment has a different effect. And I just we would just encourage that you have the effect that actually broadens your your, your experience versus, makes you become mindless so uh like share subscribe uh if you like our stuff share uh and we'll be back next time i don't think we need to give any disclaimers uh we'll be back for wheel of time on the next episode thank you very much and we'll see you